Hello and welcome to our Wednesday afternoon study through the book of Proverbs. The Old Testament, we are going chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the Old Testament on this midweek study. And we find ourselves in chapter 21 of the book of Proverbs. And I want to present just a, a few things to you right up front here so that um, you can kind of be mulling this over. Uh, once again, we're, we're, we're trying to use this, this time as we're going through the Old Testament together as a resource for you, whether you be um, leading a, a family devotional or a, a small group or just fellowshipping around the Word with your spouse um, or a friend. Uh, we, we want this to be a resource for you. We don't want to neglect the Old Testament. And uh, I have an exercise, I have a question, and I have a comparison for you. And this is really going to be um, kind of like a little journey with me through this chapter, uh, how I like to study the Scripture. And, and hopefully that's, that's going to be helpful to you. Maybe I can show you a few tricks uh, that I use on, on blueletterbible.com. To, um, to be of use to you. Maybe you already know these tools are available, and, and if that's the case, then that's great. But, but there's, there's many people who don't realize what a powerful tool we have at our fingertips, on the computer, on our cell phones even, uh, on tablets. We have access to a, a very, very powerful tool for Bible study. And if you're a Bible student, you really need to know about this. And um, so we're going to jump over here to my computer screen. And the first thing I want us to have on, on, on our on minds here is this exercise. So as we go through this chapter, do your best to look to Jesus. Do your best to look to Jesus in this chapter. Is there any reference that points to him? So there's the question. Is there anything that you can find in this chapter that points to Jesus? For example... In verse 1, we will see here in just a second, we see a king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And um, to me, that just, that, that just is a signpost to pointing to Jesus. Anytime I see the word king, I'm thinking, oh, is, well, there's, Jesus is a king. And so, um, yeah, any, anytime there is a reference that, that points to Jesus, jot it down, make note of it, talk about it, tell somebody, um, and, and run it by them. See if they agree with you. Um, that's why we have this sign above my head here. It says, looking unto Jesus. That's sort of our church motto. And then in, here's a question for you to consider. Can you think of a biblical story that illustrates the phrase, right in his own eyes? We're going to come across a verse that is, well, it's verse 2, right after verse 1. That phrase, right in his own eyes. And... Um, and then consider it devotionally asking yourself um, if, if or inviting the Lord to search and to weigh your heart. So invite the Lord to search your heart, just like David did in Psalm 139 there. Search my heart, O Lord. And then uh, finally, there's, there's a kind of a fun and humorous comparison. Uh, com comparing and contrasting verses or lines of verses can be a very useful biblical study tool. And it, verse 9 and verse 19, you might just, you know, circle those two verses and um, there's, there's an interesting comparison that you might draw from those two verses. Okay, so we'll leave that for now. And um, I wanted to introduce uh, here, we have, we have Ezra behind the computer doing some technical pro production for us. We have Noah doing the switcher. And uh, he's got a new tool today, uh, switching to, to the computer screen that I'm going to be using here. So that's kind of fun. So I'll be talking to Noah um, throughout our time. And then, of course, we've got Pastor Jim here as well. And Pastor Jim has got a very high-tech piece of clothing on. He's got an electric jacket on. And, and I'm telling you, I think it's glowing red right now. It has red lights on it. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it. So... It's nice to have Pastor Jim here in the house. So let's open up with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for um, these gentlemen who are with me. And as we are here to look 
into the scriptures, to peer into your revelation, that we might encounter you and that we would be transformed uh, by the renewing of our mind, by the washing of your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's always a good time to be in the word. So here we go. Verse 1. It says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Okay, so we have, throughout history, we've seen this to be the case. We have kings that God has obviously steered to the left or to the right to accomplish his sovereign will. Uh, some of the examples of, of those kings, you might think of a few, but we think of, of God kind of steering Pharaoh towards Joseph, the, you know, and, and Joseph ends up being second in command under Pharaoh. And it took the baker uh, and, and uh, what was the other one? Noah, Ezra, the baker and the in jail with them. Oh, we're all blanking. Oh, well, Pastor Jim just went to go get some hot coffee. So, so the, the, the baker in prison, um, the cupbearer, thank you. Oh, yes. um, the cupbearer and the baker there, God used those, those prisoners to eventually steer Pharaoh to Joseph. We have examples like that. We have Cyrus, um, uh, who, who God steers um, towards the blessing of Israel to return, to, to rebuild um, the, the, the walls and to rebuild Jerusalem. And so we, we see examples of that. But um, when you think about a, a, a river, I, I've spent the last few years a lot of time on, on the Willamette here and the Yamhill River. And when you, when you think about the river, it's constantly changing. And, and you can, the power of that water moving downstream, if it's redirected slightly, like if a tree falls or something, it can actually change the shape of the river. Over time, it, it, it gets windier and windier. Um, and, you know, uh, if you see a little a stream that starts to erode a hillside, it just takes a little pebble to, to move that stream over to the right or to the left. And this is... This is what God is doing. He can use circumstances. He can, he can, um, he just, he knows how to accomplish his will. And, and I love that. And so I think that's what this verse is referring to. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Even the king, I mean, not, not just the lowly peasant, but, but the king, right? We think of kings as being, you know, in control. Well, God steers the kings like a river. He turns it wherever he wishes. Now, because I suggested the exercise to look unto Jesus in this chapter, I, I have to point out that right here in verse 1, I, I see a, a signpost pointing to Jesus. In fact, in my Bible, I, I put a little, a little cross right here, right next to that verse, because our King, our King Jesus, his heart is in the hand of the Father. He was doing the, the work of the Father. He would only do the, the will of the Father, and, um, and he perfectly, I think, embodies this idea of where the king's heart ought to be. A ruler's heart ought to be at the feet of our Heavenly Father, saying, Lord, what is it that you want me to do today? He would steal away from his disciples and from the crowds, and he would... He would do business with the Father, and the Father would give him directions for the day, and he would, he would give him wisdom and insight, and, and oftentimes he would go immediately after, after an early morning prayer and go teach his disciples something, or, or pick his disciples, or, or do a miracle. He was very strategic. Whatever Jesus was doing, he was doing it for a purpose, and that purpose came from the Father. And even when he was accused of, uh, by, the, by the Pharisees um, of, of, you know, basically they wanted to kill him because he was doing stuff on the Sabbath that he shouldn't have been doing according to man's law. He just said, I'm just doing the will of the Father. I'm just doing what I see him doing. And, and I just love that. I love that our Savior, 
his heart was in the hands of the Father. And we can follow his example in this. Don't, don't make God hit you upside the head with a two by four. Cooperate with him. You know, participate with him. Spend time with him. Let him be gentle towards you as he guides and directs you, your river of life, so to speak. All right, in verse 2, it says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. All right, now, um, I want to show you something here. In I'm going to grab some of these verses here. We'll just grab a couple here. If you go, um, go ahead and switch over to my computer screen here, Noah. So here's blueletterbible.org. All right, now you need to, to visit this website. They have apps for phones and, and um, tablets and stuff that you can get on your, on your uh, devices. But uh, I, really, I really like to use this um, for, for kind of the hub for my Bible study. The great thing about it is it's free. You can support them. They, they receive donations from people that use it, um, users like myself and stuff. But, um, but it's, it's absolutely free for you to use. Now, over here, one of the first things you'll see is this multiverse retrieval right here. Okay, so you can, you can type in verses here. I'm just going to put in a couple verses that I thought of on, on this verse 2. Every way of man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. Sometimes when you're reading scripture, you're, you're gonna, the Holy Spirit will bring other passages to mind. Well, you can just type those in right there. Pick your Bible translation and say, retrieve. And, and here we are. Now, if you click this tool, we got, we got both of these verses, the Judges 17.6 and then the Psalm 139, 23 and 24. We got these all compiled here. If you have 20 verses, it's kind of nice to be able to just type those in, bring them all up, and, and without pages having to be turned, you got a whole list of passages with the tools right here. So I can, I can hit interlinear and uh, go right into all of the, the tools that are available here. Um, but uh, so anyway, let's read these verses. In Judges 17, 6, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That is the theme of the book of Judges. Everyone's doing what's right in his own eyes. And then I, I also thought of this one Psalm 139 passage in 23 and 24. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. So there's a contrast between these two ideas. And you ha so you have, you have the theme of judges, that, that phrase, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. As we see in this second um, proverb here, every way of a man is, was right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. So there's that first idea of, of when we do what's right in our eyes, and then the second idea to that is the Lord taking what we think and mulling it over and contemplating it and searching it. You see, the Lord, he has standards and he has a way of, of weighing things that's different than the way we weigh things. And we can think something looks good to us, but what's important is what does the Lord think about that? And so uh, you, you're going to find yourselves in one of those two camps. You're either going to be doing what's right in your own eyes, or you're going to be submitting to what you think is right in your own eyes. You're going to be submitting that to the Lord and asking him to search your heart, like the psalmist did. The da David, he, he's, the, he's the psalmist that I believe wrote 139 here, and he says, Search me, God, know my heart. Try me and, and like, test me, you know. Know my, all of my fears and my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me. That is the posture of, of the servant of Christ. That's the posture of the disciple of Jesus. Hey, Lord, this is what I'm considering. Is it good in your eyes? That's what I'm concerned about. 
we see that throughout the book of Judges, we see the results of everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. And it's not good. It's destructive. And it's death is, is where it ultimately leads to. Okay, so back to, uh, back to this passage here. Um, I want to, I want to also uh, point, as we're going, I'm going to point some, some tools here that I really like to use in Blue Litter Bible. If you go up here to where it says, um, no, send them to my computer screen here. It says, listen to the Bible. Okay. Um, this looks a little bit different on the phone, but they have the same tool on the phone, on your phone. So you click on listen to the Bible, and I like to do New Kings James because that's what we consistently use as a church when we teach from. So I click on that New Kings James, and here we go. You got some options over here. You click on this, and you could say, I want to repeat this over and over again. Uh, I just want to hear this chapter. I'm going to be, you know, driving in the car, or I'm going to be... Um, just sitting here and enjoying my coffee and I want to hear this chapter as many times as I can. <laughs> just hit repeat. Um, if you want to continue to go um, uh, or continuous, you, you click that. So you can adjust the speed of it, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to have you listen to it at normal speed here. The plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty, but those of everyone who is hasty surely to poverty. Get Okay, so you, you got a guy reading the scriptures to you. Um, if, you're, if you're bedridden because your, your legs hurt or you're in the hospital, man, all it takes is a device like this and you can just have someone reading, reading scripture to you. That is such a delight and, and a, really a, a gift. Um, consider using that. Uh, listen to the Bible feature right there. It's kind of hard to find if you're not looking for it. So make sure you check that out. Now, um, we're gonna we're gonna be here. Um, let's just look at verse one here while we're while we're at it. If you click on tools or hover over tools, look at all of these tools you got here. First one, interlinear. Uh, there are different views on this. There's the Septuagint. That's the Greek translation. If you if you want to stay in Greek, but. Um, I want to, if you go all the way to the end here where it says reverse inline, this is kind of a cool layout here. It just has it from the, from the English, the way the New King James translated it in English, and it goes, it just lines up the Hebrew right underneath it. And you can even, down here you have the, um, the tenses of the, you know, the verbs and everything. So right down here you can see he turneth it. That's, well, let's click on that word. And you don't know how to say it? That's okay. You just... Strong's age, 51 Let 86. them say it for you. Nahe. 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 Second All right. Entry. Now you know how to say the word. Nata. Nata. I like that version better. Nata. That's a lot easier to say. You, you can scroll down here. You got a word... Um, you got all the biblical usage right here to stretch out, to extend, to stretch, to offer, to, to bend, to turn, to incline. Um, you kind of get a, an idea just by scrolling through there. You got Strong's definition. You got uh, Brown Driver Briggs lexicon. You can scroll through that. But go all the way down. And what's really cool about the, this as far as a word study is it compiles every word in the Old Testament, that Hebrew word, in order from Genesis all the way through. And if you really want to bottom out on a word, you just read every single verse that has that word in it. And you will get, you will become an expert on that word. It's amazing just by reading all of the scriptures that have that one word in it. Um, you used to have to have a concordance and look, look up every single verse. This makes it just super easy to do. Um, there's so many occurrences that you got to click on several pages of these to get all the way through Malachi. All right. So, so that's the idea, um, of, of the word study. And, um, this is another view that you, that you can, you can do. So right here, forward, reverse, forward in line and reverse in line. Those are the different views you have. So you got your Strong's number, 
That's how you click, that's where I just was. Then you have your, your um, English equivalent, you have your audio, and then you have your parsing right here. Okay, and if you wanna learn you know, how, to, how to write that in Hebrew, <laughs> there it is uh, on the left. That, this is an extremely powerful tool, and I have been so blessed by it um, devotionally. Uh, when, you, when you really wanna, when you come to a, 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 a verse that kinda jumps off the page, do a word study on the verb of that verse. It will bless you. Um, if there's something that you don't quite understand, then start clicking and, and start digging. That It's a very powerful tool. So use that interlinear. I also wanna show you, um, just real quick, the Bible translations. We have a lot of really good English translations and they compile all of those without having to have, you know, 27 Bibles laid out on your desk. It looks up every, that verse in all of these translations and puts them right in front of you. And this is an, another really good way to study a verse. I'm finding that in the, in the Proverbs, whenever I come to a proverb that's hard to understand, this right here is extremely helpful. When I read all of the English translations, it really gives me a, a, a better understanding of, wow, that's a, really, that's a really difficult idea to translate. I can see how they struggled with that. You'll have, you'll have everything from like opposite um, meanings in some translations, um, and, and then you, you gotta scratch your head and go like, well, which one is it? Um, Proverbs in particular are, can be very, can be very uh, difficult to translate. Um, a Hebrew proverb into an English proverb. Not an easy task. So, you, so use the Bible translations um, and, and that, uh, I, think, I think that will help you as a Bible student. You got cross references. Um, that can be a fun way to jump around the scriptures all over and, and, and carry a theme throughout the, the word. Um, if you've been studying the Bible a long time, um, that'll start to happen on your own. The, the Spirit of God will just bring back a story from, from here or a parable from here, and you can kind of jump around on your own. But if you need some help, use those cross-references. Those are, those are extremely helpful. There's commentaries. You can go, you can listen to, to Chuck Smith, um, our, our dear pastor's brother, John Corson. You got J. Vernon McGee. Um, uh, wonderful Bi Bible um, teachers and, and really a pastor's library right here. Um, I've been enjoying David Guzek. He's got some study guides, um, chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the Bible. Very helpful. Um, pastor Chuck Smith as well, Matthew Henry. So text commentaries, um, but, but these ones actually are video, audio video. So if we wanted to watch uh, the, the teaching on a, from a Sunday morning um, from whatever year, this Chuck Smith's 1979 to 1982 audio, and so these other guys got videos, you have access to those. So no need to go spend hundreds and hundreds and maybe thousands of dollars on, on um, all of these commentaries. You, you have free resources right here for you. And then um, Bible dictionaries and miscellaneous. So. Um, you just need to know that these tools are available to you. Um, and we can go, go ahead and come back here. Noah, too. I don't want them st having to stare at my computer screen the whole time. Um, so I know that was a little bit of a, a you know, a side trail there. Um, but I really, I really just wanted to, to cover some of those tools. If you've never seen one or two of those, um, if you didn't even know this website existed, I think it's one of the best things on the internet. So, um, uh, just sharpen your skills as a Bible student and and get in there and dig around and start clicking and see what what God what journey God takes you on. Okay. Um, so it, verse three: Do to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. So, I don't know if you remember the story from 1 Samuel 15, 22, but I'll, I'll go ahead and turn there. 1 Samuel 15, this story jumped to my mind as I was going through this. Because Samuel says something very similar. 
He says, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than that than the fat of rams. Okay, so this is spoken to Saul who is blaming his people for his own disobedience. And and Samuel instructed him to not take the the sheeps or the sheep the the well, I'll just read it. Verse 20. Um, ver, I'm sorry, verse 17. Samuel says, When you were little, your own eye, in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel, and did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do this evil in the sight of the Lord? And then Saul says, well, I actually was obedient. It was just the people that, that the people took of the plunder and the sheep and the oxen. But th- we did this so that we could sacrifice it to the Lord. And that's when Samuel says, you know what? It, it's better just to obey. It would have been better for you just to obey the Lord's voice than to, to presume that a sacrifice that he didn't ask for um, would, would be better than just the obedience. Just trusting him, just obeying him. So there we have a repetition um, from that narrative right here in the Proverbs. It's, it's It's just better to do righteousness and justice than to, you know, put on this religious um, external behavior, you know. God would rather you to be to have that clean. Um, the, the pot clean on the inside, not just shiny on the outside and all dirty on the inside. You know, I don't want, I don't want a, a dish that you cooked for me if it was a dirty dish on the inside and it was all polished on the outside. Who cares about the outside? I want to know, is it clean inside? And that is what the Lord is looking for. He's looking for clean hearts. And the other, the other Jesus says, you know, if you clean the inside of the pot, then the outside will also get clean. First things first. And, and I, I was led by that verse um, to that narrative, and I, I really appreciate that story. We are, are um, it's easy to be tempted to kind of do the, the Christian, uh, the talk like a Christian and to do Christian things without the real intent of the heart being there. Whether that be as we worship and sing songs, whether that means you know we, we're, we're begrudgingly opening the Bible or, or we're doing it because we want to meet with the Lord or we're saying a prayer out of rote or we're, doing a, we're saying a prayer because we, we want to speak to the Lord. It's a very different thing um, altogether. So uh, just keep that in mind from that proverb. Verse For a haughty look, a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked are sin. The plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty, but those of everyone who is hasty surely to poverty. Again, there's a comparison and contrast there. Diligence, compare and contrast that with hasty. And then plenty, compare and contrast that to poverty. Uh, Which one would you rather have? Well, be diligent. That leads to plenty. Verse 6, getting treasures by a lying tongue is the fleeting fancy of the fantasy of those who seek death. Verse 7, the violence of the wicked will destroy them because they refuse to do justice. The way of a guilty man is perverse, but as for the pure, his work is right. His work. You know, There was one that was pure, and there was one that did the work, and that work was right, and that was the work that Jesus did on the cross. His work, that's, that's what we look to. We look to the cross. Verse 9, better to dwell in a corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a contentious woman. So maybe circle that verse. We're going to come back to that. 
in a little bit. Verse 10, the soul of the wicked desires evil. Desires evil. Do you find yourself desiring what's evil? You don't want to desire what's evil, but you desire it. Well, the soul of the wicked desires evil. His neighbor finds no favor in his eyes. When the scoffer is punished, the simple is made wise. My iPad here is annoying me. But when the wise is instructed, he receives knowledge. The righteous God wisely the righteous God wisely considers the house of the wicked, overthrowing the wicked for their wickedness. Verse 13. Whoever shuts his ears to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be heard. Kind of what goes around comes around. Verse 14. A gift in secret pacifies anger and a bribe behind the back strong wrath. So then you so there you have um, pacifying anger and strong wrath. Uh, you know, even even giving with a with a bad motive works, you know? Even when you're generous with a bad motive, that that actually works to pacify. How much more would would generous giving um, pacify anger when it has good motives. And then uh, verse 15, it is a joy for the just to do justice, but destruction will come to the workers of iniquity. A man who wanders from the way of understanding will rest in the assembly of the dead. Verse 17, he who loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. Um, I, I just, again, we, we're talking about that desire. And it, it, this speaks to that, the, the hedonist or the materialist. The, they, they desire, just, just give me uh, pleasure. You know, just, just give me the wine. Just give me the oil. And, and that's the end within itself is just, I just want the stuff. Now, if we jump down to verse 20, we see a different kind of treasure and a different kind of oil. We're going to jump down to 20 there. It says, There is desirable treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise. And I would suggest that maybe that treasure and that oil might be the word of the Lord and the, the Spirit. That combination of the word and the Spirit is a powerful combination. And that's that's the one who is wise they there's a desire for the word and and they they're living in the spirit but a foolish man squanders it and so we have that that idea of are we just living for the here and now and the material and, and the, the you know the, the hedonist or are we spiritual people and are we fixing our eyes within wisdom on Jesus, on his word, walking in the spirit. Okay, back to 18. The wicked shall be a ransom for the righteous and the unfaithful for the upright. And then, um, well, th this one was a kind of an interesting one. Um, I, I want to suggest that uh, it's kind of an uncomfortable thought. But it says the wicked shall be a ransom for the righteous and the unfaithful for the upright. You know, you know, Jesus became our wickedness. He became our unfaithfulness. It says in Galatians 3, 13 and 14, and in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that he became the curse for us. He became our sin. And I, I'm sorry, but that, it's, it's not a very comfortable thought for me. <laughs> The, the idea of, of Jesus being my, wick, my wickedness, Jesus being my sin, Jesus being a curse for me. But that's exactly what he was. He, he's our ransom. He is our ransom. Um, and, it, and it cost him everything. 
19, better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. Okay, so jumping right back to verse 9, it says better to dwell in a corner of a housetop. <laughs> so we've moved the, the man from the corner of the housetop. Now he's in the wilderness <laughs> and it's, it, we're, we're progress he's getting further and further away from this contentious woman. But not, it's not just a contentious woman here, but it's a contentious and angry woman or, or brawling woman. Let's, let's look at real quick on my computer here. Um, verse 19. So here's 19. I'm just going to do a little word study on uh, an angry woman, a contentious and angry. Kaas. Let's, let's click on this and see what we find here. Uh, grief, provocation, wrath, sorrow, anger, indignation, provoking, sore, spite. Okay, so we get, we're getting an idea here. Um, now let's go, let's go back to and do contentious, madon. And we'll just get an idea of this word here. Strife, contention, quarrel, brawling. There it is, brawling. You know, um, elsewhere in the Proverbs it says, uh, um, what a gift a, a godly woman is to a, to a man. Uh, May our, may our relationships not be characterized by brawling and contentiousness. It says um, up, up above, we just talked about um, the idea of uh, a gift in secret pacifies anger and a bribe behind a back, strong wrath. Just, just that disarming of, of giving people grace. Look at verse um, 22, a wise man scales the city of the mighty and brings down the trusted stronghold. You know, the, the whether it be in a, in a relationship with your spouse or a relationship with your children, the, the wise person disarms their spouse or disarms their children with, with grace and with wisdom. They, they, don't, they don't fight back. They don't brawl back. They're not contentious in return. But when there's, when there's a wall, the wise man scales the, the city of the mighty and brings down the trusted stronghold with wisdom. That's how, you, that's how you break down walls, with wisdom. The wisdom of the Spirit. And I would just suggest to you, just look at, at God's very nature. He's slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, full of grace, full of truth. It, his nature is disarming. He invites us when we've offended him. He doesn't go, now go to your room. He says, come to me. It's, it's a very disarming thing. He, he, wants, he wants us to be, he wants to, our minds to be changed and transformed. But he doesn't want us to be cast out. He wants to bring us close and he wants to disciple us. The idea of discipline is discipling, teaching. And um, that, that, that can be done with grace, with wisdom, with gentleness, and and um, do your best to to uh, you know break down those walls by the power of God's Spirit, rather than you know trying to do that in in your carnal nature, in your flesh. That you'll end up brawling with the people that you love most, your your family members, and um, you'll be contentious, and, and that spirit kind of it just spreads. So. Um, moving on uh, to finish up the chapter here, uh, we'll, we'll go to verse 25. The desire of the lazy man kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. He covets greedily all day long, but the righteous gives and does not spare. Uh, it just basically says, don't be lazy. Work towards your desire. Desire is one thing. Oh, I really want to... I really want to be, you know, a successful violinist. Well, you got to work. <laughs> you got to practice. You got to get a violin and then you got to spend hours a day practicing <laughs> if you want to become a really good violinist. The, the desire doesn't get you anywhere unless you actually work towards that desire. And uh, 
it's it, it'll it'll rob you it'll it'll steal from you if you just have desire that goes unmet you need to have something worthy of your desire and then you need to work towards it uh, otherwise you'll end up a lazy fool as it says here 27 the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination how much more when he brings it with wicked intent 28 a false witness shall perish but the man who hears him will speak endlessly uh, speaking of a corrupt judge or, or the public opinion Verse 29, a, a wicked man hardens his face, but as for the upright, he establishes his way. Verse 30, there is no wisdom or understanding or counsel against the Lord. And then finally, verse 31, the Lord is prepared for the day of battle. I'm sorry, the Lord, the horse. <laughs> the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. And uh, just to end this proverb here on that thought you know maybe it sounds a little pithy but do your best and and commit the rest the, the horse has been prepared for battle but it's the lord that is going to bring the, the deliverance in the battle he is the one who brings the victory you know um, moses had his has a, had his arms held up uh and and joshua was down fighting the battle but it was the lord that gave them the victory that day uh, whenever the arms were outstretched. So God bless you. And, and I hope some of those tools that were shared uh, on, on blueletterbible.org um, were helpful and that, that you take advantage of those when you get a chance. I really encourage you to do so. So if you want to fellowship around the word, um, here's a couple of questions and exercises that you can use to, to um, springboard into conversation. God bless you.